Hello, everyone. I'm just waiting for y'all to get in. We'll get started in just a minute. Okay. Welcome everyone. I'm Megan Anderson, the events coordinator here at Park Road Books. Um, you're here tonight because you purchased a copy of Vivian Howard's This Will Make It Taste Good. And we're so excited to have you and Vivian here cooking for us. Um, tonight, she's gonna discuss her new book as well as do a cooking demonstration. She is going to focus on the flavor hero, Quirky Furky tonight, um, which is in your book. I don't know if you've gotten there yet. Um, we encourage you to put any questions or comments you have in the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen, and we will answer those at the end of the cooking demonstration. Um, anything you want to ask her, you can put in there, and we will um, go over it together at the end. Um, additionally, I just want to remind you that um, by attending our event, you're agreeing to our code of conduct, which is a zero harassment tolerance policy. Any harassment in any forum, either on the chat or so on and so forth, will not be tolerated and you will be directly kicked out of the event and other events in the future. Um, that being said, I don't think we'll have any problems with that tonight. Um, so just to introduce Vivian, I'm sure all of you know, but she is a New York Times bestselling author. She is the author of Deep Run Roots, which was named Cookbook of the Year by International Association of Culinary Professionals, a very well-loved book at Park Road Books. She co-created and stars in the public television shows Somewhere South and A Chef's Life, for which she's won a Peabody, an Emmy, and James Beard Awards. She runs the restaurants Chef and Farmer, Benny's Big Time, Lenore, Handy and Hot, and lives in Deep Run, North Carolina with her husband, Ben, and their twins, Theo and Flo. Signed copies are available at Park Road Books. If you want to get any more for any of your family and friends, you can get them by calling us, going to our website, or of course, just stopping by. So let's enjoy this demonstration. And again, if you have any questions or comments, just put them in the Q&A section at the bottom. Thanks. Hey there. Hey there, everybody. Um, sorry for the uh, ray of light coming down from heaven into my test kitchen. I normally have um, a, uh, someone who helps me set this up, but they are out of town, so I had to do all the technical stuff myself. And um, you, she could hear me cursing in the background trying to get these lights right. No, no, I heard you giggle. I heard you. <laughs> um, you're glad I didn't just take them and smash them on the floor, but I didn't because I, I was excited to talk to y'all about my um, my new book. This will make it taste good. And I'm kind of assuming that if you're here and you took the leap to buy my second book, you probably have, some, have my first. And you're probably flipping through this and saying, wow, this is really, really different. And um, you would be right. 
Uh, but there are so many things about it that are, are very much the same uh, in that, you know, Deep Run Roots was really a, a love letter to Eastern North Carolina and the food of that region. Um, it was both narrative and historical. Um, and this is really um, a narrative cookbook about my personal journey as a, a woman and a chef and a daughter who lives across the road from her parents. Uh, so it's very much um, more, oddly enough, even more personal. And it's really about the way that I cook at home. Um, but, you know, as a uh, someone who's cooked most of their uh, adult life in restaurant kitchens, the way that I cook at home is, you know, really uh, uh, informed by the way that I have always cooked in my restaurants. And for as long as I can remember, we have made these little things. Um, I call them flavor heroes. Uh, at the restaurants, they took on, you know, colloquial terms, which some of them are reflected in here, and they're the things that we use to bring really simple food, really simple ingredients together to make them exciting. Um, and you know, the way this whole book started was that I, um, after Deep Run Roots came out, I woke up every um, morning for a year, and the first thing I did was check Amazon for the new reviews on Deep Run Roots, and I read them all, and I looked for trends over time. And one of the things that I saw was that people wanted um, a, a more simple cookbook. They wanted more simple recipes. Um, and so I was like, come hell or high water, Vivian Howard is gonna write a simple cookbook. And so I, I started doing that. I wrote a proposal for it. Um, I wrote a table of contents. I started fleshing out the recipes and I was so dang bored. Like it was fine. Um, I think it looked like a lot of cookbooks in that, you know, it offered a lot of good information and it was simple and it was streamlined, but there was none of me or the way that I really cook in it. And at the bottom of that book, there was a chapter called, this will make it taste good. And it was, that chapter was the way that I was going to allow myself to actually be able to finish the simple book by saying like, Hey guys, if you've stuck with me all the way through this and, and you want to make all this simple stuff really exciting, make these flavor heroes and incorporate them here and here and here. And so eventually I got fed up and I decided that I was going to write a whole book about that chapter. This will make it taste good. So that's what you have here. Um, if you, if you get tired of me on here, which I am, I think that this book has a really beautiful uh, actual jacket that makes it even more appropriate for your coffee table. Um, so every chapter in this book is about a flavor here. And this whole idea is designed to streamline the way that you cook and to empower you to cook without recipes. So each of these things, um, the book starts with one called Little Green Dress. And Little Green Dress is uh, named Little Green Dress because of the whole idea of little black dress, that dress that goes with everything. And this is that version of a green sauce. It's like chimichurri and salsa verde had a baby in a bed of olives. Um, and, you know, it opens with a picture of the hero. Every chapter opens this way. Then there's a process shot of how to make it. Then you, you get a story about what it means. And then these really um, out of the box kind of uh, portraits of me personifying the personality of the hero. So, you know, if, if, if you haven't caught on yet, this is a really different cookbook. Um, and it allowed me to flex my creativity in ways that um, were really exciting and um, probably the most enjoyable creative endeavor of my life. So then there's an essay about that particular hero. And then this is probably one of my favorite parts of every chapter, these no-brainer ways to use it. Uh, really simple things like drizzling on a baked potato or mixing into egg or chicken salad. And then within the chapter, there's 10 or so like fleshed out recipes of ways to use this little green dress. But the thing is that all these recipes are incredibly simple. 
Um, and it, I'm, I'm so proud of this book and the way that it approaches the idea of like actual meal prep so that we can work smarter and not harder in our kitchens. And if we wanna get ahead on the weekends, like let's not roast Brussels sprouts to then reheat and make worse on Wednesday. Let's not grill boneless, skinless chicken to do the same. Let's make these flavor heroes and use them to whip up a quick pasta or saute vegetables and make them like salivatingly delicious. And so tonight, the flavor hero that we're talking about is called Quirky Furky. So you saw Little Green Dress had a very, you know, unusual, unusual name. The names of all the recipes in the book are meant to kind of explain not only um, what it is, but more so it, what it does and what its personality is. And so Quirky Furky is a riff on um, the ubiquitous Japanese rice seasoning. Um, and, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not delusional. I know that I'm Vivian Howard and I am a white woman from the South and anything aside from collard greens and cornbread for me uh, may seem out of the box and perhaps um, not something I should be doing. But I want you to know that the reason that this take on furikake uh, shows up in the book is because Yes, I am a white woman who lives in Eastern North Carolina. I have two children, they're nine years old. Um, and, and for them, I want them to understand that they are not the center of the universe, that there are you know, hundreds of cultures around them. There are hundreds of food traditions and cultures that exist around the world. And for me, learning about those cultures is most tangible through those cultures foods. So we cook a lot of different types of food in our house. And I, we, I study a lot of different types of food. And so I'm paying homage to furikake, which is basically, not basically, but it's something that is used in Japanese culture as often as we use ketchup. But I would argue that it's more versatile. So Perky Furky is um, basically a dry um, seasoning. Think about everything bagel seasoning. Um, something that is uh, salt and perhaps a little sugar driven, but brings along with it uh, a lot of different flavors. So the basics, the basic things in Perky Furky, and it's called Perky Furky because it's a riff on furikake, but it has like a, a quirky element that we're going to get to here in the end that really makes it very, um, makes it speak to, to my particular kitchen. So um, it starts with uh, roasted seaweed. And, you know, I, I took great pride in this book in that, you know, I would say 95% of all the ingredients represented in the book you can find at your local Walmart. I did that because I live in um, a community where the most variety is represented at Walmart. And so that was my litmus test. That being said, you can find some version of all of these things, believe it or not, at the Walmart in Lenore County. So, and if you can find it, I, if I can find it, I bet you can. So roasted seaweed or nori. So it comes in sheets like this. And this is what you would have wrapped around your sushi roll. It has um, a, a lot of umami and uh, sea driven notes. And what you're gonna do is toast this over a flame or in your oven for, at 350 for about five minutes. And it's gonna get really crunchy so that you can break it up and it kind of toast it. There's all kinds of brands that you can use. You can even use those seaweed snacks that come in the small containers that are sold at a lot of um, health food stores, that works too. Um, nothing about this book is really particular. It's about like you identifying the, the things that um, are closest to what I recommend in your world and working with that. Because I'll tell you the trick of a really good cookbook is that all the recipes work 10 degrees from right and 10 degrees from wrong. Um, that, 
so that you can find success and we're not doing anything so particular on my end that it doesn't work for you at your home. So the next thing that is, is in my perky perky or furry cake um, are these little baby shrimp that I actually got um, at uh, the Asia market in Cary. So you could absolutely use bonito flakes. That's, that's very common. Um, I like these because I think they give a, you know, a nice texture and they have a lot more flavor for me than bonito, but you could absolutely use bonito flakes. Um, you need sesame seeds. Sesame seeds give the furikake a really nice nutty flavor. And you could use black sesame seeds or white sesame seeds, but I choose white sesame seeds because um, I can see when they're toasting. And black sesame seeds, I can't always, and I might end up, end up with a, a burnt seed. Um, I also have flaky salt. Um, if you don't have that, you could absolutely use uh, kosher salt. I would not choose iodized just mainly because the salinity is different, the particle is different, it's just gonna sink to the bottom. And then here I have turbinado sugar, which turbinado sugar just has a larger particle and is drier. It has a larger particle than granulated white sugar and it's drier than uh, traditional brown sugar. And so I like it for the size of its particle. And so from there, um, it's really simple to put this together. Um, oh wait, I forgot the thing that makes it um, speak to me, if you will. So this, these are the basic ingredients for a traditional furikake. I mean, there's all different ways that it's interpreted in Japan, but I would say that these are some of the basics right here. Um, and people sprinkle it on rice, they sprinkle it on vegetables. It is, it is, you know, the hot sauce that is in everybody's pocket if they travel with their own condiments. Um, but for me, I always, when I, I use for a cake, I want there to be some brightness. I want there to be some acid. And if you follow me, much at all or read much about my cooking, I'm um, known to be like acidic. And so what I do with my quirky furky to make it quirky is I crush up salt and vinegar potato chips and incorporate that into my quirky furky because that adds additional texture, which is one of the big things that this flavor hero is gonna bring you. It adds acid, it adds salt, it adds girth, um, and, you know, I'm not tied to, you know, I don't have a relationship with Cape Cod. I wish I did. Maybe they're watching right now. Um, but I do generally choose this brand because the chips seem to be sturdier and they um, crumble up and, and hold their shape. And I really like the level of acidity uh, that they bring. So you can see how pretty this ends up being. Um, so it makes a great... Um, a great hero to sprinkle on any number of things like no brainer ways to use this furry cake are to you know bring some butter to room temperature and stir in the furry cake then cook a steak or a pork chop or a piece of fish or a piece of grilled eggplant and melt that compound butter on top of that particular item that you're then going to gobble up um, you could uh, sprinkle this. One of the things I like to do with this is take the, the larger par particle and then pulse it in either a food processor or a blender. Here I have it in a, a spice mill or a coffee grinder and it makes um, a powder. And we're going to make some meatballs with this in just a minute. But you can see how it makes it um, much more fine, almost like uh, furikake sand. And so this would be excellent sprinkled over just pop popcorn. Um, you know, you could roast shishito peppers or asparagus or summer squash and toss it with the furry cake and a squeeze of lime. In a pinch, if you find yourself cooking from um, an Asian inspired cookbook and you're looking for fish sauce um, and you don't have any or soy sauce, you could actually use this blended up furry cake in a pinch to give you that sea-driven umame um, that you're gonna get from that ingredient. 
Um, I like to also sprinkle this on uh, watermelon or cantaloupe and, and then squeeze a little bit of lemon on it. The possibilities are endless. And I'm not even telling you about my favorite recipe within this chapter, which is the uh, Inspiration Sprite Spikes Party Rolls. Uh, so all of you have the book, so you should be able to look at that. There's a great story associated with that particular recipe about how I, um, how I find inspiration at the grocery store. Um, even if the grocery store is a rural Piggly Wiggly and you're trying to develop and test recipes for a furry cake in your book. So one of my favorite things to do with this ingredient is to use it as a base seasoning. So what I'm gonna do, is I have actually, um, we just reopened Chef and the Farmer uh, about a week ago, very quietly. And I, um, I've been working there and I just ran here uh, about 45 minutes ago to get started on this. And I grabbed these uh, burgers that we had portioned out um, for tonight. And I'm gonna make a little meatball with them. I also grabbed some pork stock that we had made. You could use chicken stock, you could use vegetable stock, whatever you have. Um, and I grabbed some tat soy greens from Warren. You could use spinach, you could use um, arugula, you could use any green you've got. You could even use romaine lettuce, okay? So the point is to make a really simple meatball green um, broth kind of soup kind of not, because for me, the point of this um, are the meatballs. So this is just ground beef. In the book, um, this is called pork meatballs bobbing in broth. But I'm using, you know, beef here um, and pork broth rather than chicken broth, because I really want you to understand that you can, you can really go between the lines here and make these recipes work for you as long as you've made this. All right, so I've got this um, ground beef and I'm gonna sprinkle my uh, finely ground furry cake into this. And then I'm just gonna mix it up. This is already um, seasoned as if it were a burger. So I'm not gonna add any additional salt, but I'm gonna really flavor these, um, this meat with my furry cake. It's gonna add acid because it has potato chips. It's gonna add a nuttiness from the toasted sesame seeds. It's gonna add a, a sea-driven salinity from the seaweed. Um, it's, it's gonna add uh, a really like deeply intense sea-driven um, note from, the, uh, from the, the dried shrimp or the bonito. And then the beautiful thing is that you have these like, um, flavored meatballs that are not only going to um, be super flavorful on their own, but they are going to flavor the broth that they cook in. So you're doing like double duty. A lot of the recipes in this book are all about like one pot cooking. One of them, I hate washing dishes. Um, I think perhaps working in a restaurant for so long and having a dish machine that, you know, you can pull the lid on and it takes, you know, 45 seconds and it's done has really made me resent um, dishwashing at home. Also probably COVID has done the same. Um, but so in writing this book, one of my goals was to give you a ton of opportunities to just cook dinner on a sheet pan or cook dinner in one pot because Again, this is about the way that I cook, and that's honestly what I do. Uh, I will leave I will leave a component out if it means I have to get out another pot or pan. So I'm putting my little uh, perky perky flavored meatballs into my broth, and I'm going to add a little bit of water to that because it cooked down a little. But I want them just barely submerged, and I'm going to simmer them. Um, and I'm also going to add these tat soy greens as they simmer. 
and then we'll season it up and talk about it. But while I do this, I wonder if anybody uh, watching has any questions. Hold on one second. I'm not. I got it. I can. I can help. <laughs> It's just my, my, my computer's plugged in, but I just had this uh, low battery thing come up. So just give me 30 seconds or five seconds. We all understand technical difficulties. I hate it. <laughs> oh, goodness. Um, Okay. That sound that sounds like success. Yes, that was a good sound. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm back. So so one of the questions we have is not necessarily about this recipe, but a uh, quirky furky recipe you mentioned. And it's asking if they can you can use ham instead of um, bologna or bologna for the party rolls. Absolutely. You know, that's, that's really what I want people to understand is that like, if, if you make these heroes and you follow the instructions that I say, like, here's what's important. I say that in every recipe because not everything is important, you know, when you write a recipe. So it's like, here's what's important. You know, if you, if you don't have, if you, if you don't have, um, uh, bologna, use ham. If you don't have bonita, use, uh, or if you don't have dried shrimp, use bonita. If you don't have cherry vinegar, use red wine vinegar. You're trying to apply like a flavor and not necessarily a specific ingredient. So absolutely make it work for you. Um, and then the other thing we have is not a question, but a comment. And it is just there, this is from Catherine and they are expressing super gratitude. And they say they live in Montana and their daughter lives in Southern Florida and they are both enjoying the event. They have the cookbook and they connect across miles over their love of food and family. We both have, both have deep run roots and your story helps us connect in such an intimate and meaningful way and has helped me as a 65 year old woman value my roots. So just some nice words to, to push you on cooking. Um, oh, we have a few more questions. Um, so Connie says, I love the picture of Ferky on the cotton candy in the book. Would that actually be yummy to eat? No. Uh, <laughs> you know, the funny thing about um, the, all of the portraits in the book, um, you know, when we set out to write this book, uh, my editor said, you know, there's going to have to be a lot of, there's gonna have to be photos of you in the book. And um, I, I have issues with like just gratuitous photos of like passing food to a family member who's actually maybe not even in the room. And like, and, and having the photo not contribute to the narrative of the book. So I had this idea uh, since we were, you know, since I was giving all of these Flavor heroes, personalities, and novel names uh, that you know are kind of things that we all understand as a culture. I was like, so what if the pictures of me in the book were me dressing up like the flavor hero? And as you can imagine, um, that got quite a bit of pushback. Uh, but I I don't like to hear no, especially when I really believe in something. And so we, um, the photographer of the book, Baxter Miller, her partner, Ryan Stansel, um, the folks from uh, Capital Shop there in Raleigh, um, we all spent a week together styling and shooting these, uh, these portraits. And it was like a, a fun dream come true uh, to be able to like do something so creative and have, you know, the resources to do it and the expertise and style and taste of people, uh, the, of the women at Capital Shop. So it was just like such a dream and a gift. Um, and 
you know, some of them, I think, uh, work better than others. I think the quirky quirky, the point was to get across, this is fun and, um, and, and something that is, is whimsical. And so I think the portrait does that. I would not recommend dipping this in cotton candy and actually eating it though. I will say. Um, I was struck by the, like the uh, personality photos of the yes, as you would call them and things like that. I feel like it really sets the cookbook apart. Um, we have a few other questions. Um, one is how long does Quirky Furky last? And that's from Aileen. So Quirky Furky in a sealed plastic container at room temperature will last for up to two months. Um, and what I recommend in the book is actually making it um, and then like keeping half of it like chunky and texture driven like this and then blending half of it and having it ready to like toss into one of my favorite um, recipes in the chapter is like cooking rice with it not sprinkle it on after like as you you know heat up your water to cook your rice you add the quirky quirky and so this is a great way to use that this is a great way to use that so when you when you make the actual hero blend half or blend some and then keep some whole and keep them in separate sealed containers. A plastic container, a jar with a tightening lid works well. And what I want to say about all of these flavor heroes is that they make the most amazing gifts. So um, hostess gifts, Christmas gifts, um, condolence gifts, whatever. Like, I don't know if you're like me, but during COVID, I realized how much junk I have yeah. and, and not even how much junk I have but how much stuff I have that I did not even purchase myself um and so mm -hmm. I, I decided and I've actually been doing this for a long time to only give consumable gifts so whether it's something that I've made food wise if it's a bottle of wine if I know people enjoy that if it's a um you know a mixer for a cocktail if it's a plant Something that um, will not uh, will not last longer than me, uh, and so these all of these are um, they all have long shelf lives. Some of them need to be refrigerated. None of them need to be canned. Um, so it would make a great any of these would make a great project for you to do with your kids to give to teachers. Um, you know. Um, if they have teachers right now, you might just be giving it back to yourself. Um, but, but you know, think about ways to you know give give this type of gift this holiday season. Um, I always have um, little green dress and community organizer and quirky perky ready for whatever kind of hostess gift or um, interview I'm going on or anytime I need to say thank you to someone because I think people love to get uh, things that they can consume. Mm -hmm. Well, that's really helpful to me as a bookseller. <laughs> I feel like I could be like, you could give this and something from it. Um, so I have someone asking that your recipe calls for cooking in a Dutch oven or large, large saucepan. Is it possible to do it in a crock pot? Um, for these, for the, for the, I assume for the, I assume for the meatballs. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, I think that this is what I think. I think as cookbook authors, uh, we have done all of y'all a disservice by having to say, heat the oil in a 10 inch skillet or Dutch oven. Um, because there are so many different uh, vessels you could do certain things in, but as cookbook authors, we're just not given the space uh, or even, you know, people's attention spans to, to list all the ways it can be done. You know, if you can see a way forward in the crock pot, and I certainly can, you could put the broth on um, and then put the meatballs in and turn it on like your lowest setting and go to work and come back and add the greens and you've got dinner, so absolutely. Um, we are, we have a bunch of other questions, um, but 
we are getting a request for you to move the computer sideways so they can see the stove. Is that possible with it? Yes, if y'all can okay. with me, okay? <laughs> Actually, what I'm gonna do is I can move the pan in just a second. Okay, great. I just wanted to, you know, the, the people have spoken. <laughs> spoken so yes i'll move it i um yes i'll make sure that you see what i've got going on here. no i get it we're rolling with it you know these these are our new events i get it <laughs> yeah and i'm i as i said i've often had some help and i thought i did pretty good until i realized i couldn't see my little range that I, got. <laughs> and my I don't think it was always that way i think it got moved so it's no big deal um would you like another question or do you want to go forth with cooking Okay, um, <clears throat> I, Julie says, I love that you were doing Quirky Furky. I recently was introduced to the seasoning blend via a meal kit delivery service. That being said, is that something on your radar? Meal kits? Mm -hmm. I think a uh, meal kit delivery service or something in that range. Yeah, you know, I dabbled a little bit with that. Um, and both on the receiving end and the providing end. Uh, through like a grocery store here in North Carolina. And then I've ordered, um, you know, a number of uh, meal deliveries. But my problem is that, you know, you get the ingredients and oftentimes there's a, a perishable nature to them. And it's like maybe like your day changes and then your tomorrow changes and you're just not ready to make- and Life happens. Yeah. yeah. It's like you don't want that poor tenderloin that came in the mail today or you don't have time for it and then you end up putting that piece of it in the freezer and then and then trying to use the other pieces and so for me it just like doesn't provide the type of um I don't know flexibility that I want and that's like this book is it, it does kind of a similar thing in that it gives you all of these flavor bases from which to build dinner um from like things that you just have around uh mm -hmm. and so that's and then you know providing the meal prep you know from my end if it's not something i'm all about doing things that i would buy and participating in events that i would attend and and so given my issues with with you know meal delivery uh services i just it's not something i get like super excited about doing if that makes any sense no 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 i think i think you answered the question beautifully um so this is a, a not a long answer question but as we move forward i feel like it should be asked are these pork meatballs or beef well these that i'm cooking right now are beef because i literally took three um formed burgers from the restaurant and That's i was Mm -hmm. But in the restaurant, in the in the cookbook, I suggest pork. I use ground turkey a lot in my house, um, and so you could use any ground meat you want. You could even okay. use, um, you know, if like you could even use like a ground breakfast sausage. Wow. Uh, so yeah, lots of lots of flexibility there. Okay, good to know. I mean, I feel like that's the trend, but still, just wanted to make sure. Yeah. <laughs> Um, is there, Faison Knox asks, is there a food processor you recommend to use? I bought one and I don't like it. Difficult to clean. I feel that way about mine. <laughs> so that's a great question um, because I have pretty much used all the food processors. So let me break it into blender food processor. So in the restaurant, um, business, you know, we're all crazy about these Vita Prep blenders. They, you know, they make really smooth purees and really smooth, you know, soups, but they're, I think they're all like $500. So I have found that at my house, or sorry, we really love, here it is. You can tell I love it because I have one at my house and I have one at my office. Um, this is my office. The Nutribullet for blending. So I think these are about $60 maybe. And for the home cook, you, you get like a the largest containers, like a quart. And, you know, it blends it just as well as the Vita Prep that we use at the restaurant. 
but you just can't do as much. So I would say that if you're looking for a blender to get sauces really smooth, one of the chapters in the book, Herdacious, does call for a high powered blender. It's not that you can't make it without it, but I really like the smooth quality that that gives it. So I would say Nutribullet. I, I hate breaking out a big piece of equipment to do something small. So I really like to have, um, while this is not a food processor, it often does what I need a food processor to do. It's a, a coffee mill that I reserve for spices and grinding things like the quirky furky. Um, I even like will chop garlic in here from time to time. You just have to make sure that when you clean something like this, you do it with like, you put dry rice in here and pulse it so that it collects all the moisture. You don't want to put water inside the container. And that being said, I think the best food processor for the money, hands down, is the Cuisinart. Um, I have like tested across the map and um, I've, in restaurants, we use this thing called a Roboku, which is the industrial, you know, kind of restaurant version of a food mm -hmm. processor. And they, they cost a thousand dollars a piece. And, and eight times out of 10 at our restaurant right now, my team is bringing out the, the Cuisinart uh, food processors, food processors that we have, because for whatever reason, they have maintained a blade longer they are easier to connect um, and they're much lighter weight. So that would be my recommendation. Very long-winded one, but I, I feel No, passionate. but this is like good information. I feel like for all the things. Um, so Marsha says she loves the graphics and the heads up and the organization of the book. So that's just some positivity your way. Yes, I'd like to say, um, can I just speak to that and say that uh, of course. one of the things that I learned writing Deep Run Roots or making Deep Run Roots is that I, I thought that writing a cookbook was just like writing a cookbook and then you, you're done with, you send the manuscript in and then all of the other stuff happens magically. And I was, I was really, you know, misinformed about that. Um, not that anyone misinformed me, I just didn't understand it going into it. So when it came time to design uh, Deep Run Roots and, and select photography and color palette and aesthetic, like I was, I was in way over my head, uh, but I knew that. And I knew that if I, when I wrote my next book that I wanted that to be um, something that really uh, spoke to who I was and, and the look that I wanted to portray. And so, the photographer of this book, Baxter Miller, I think you'll see that the photos from food to process to portraits are really next level stunning. Um, and she did such an amazing job, uh, both like styling it and like streamlining the aesthetic, the same plates occur over and over and over again. And that's also to drive home that like, you know, you don't have to have a whole lot of stuff to make beautiful food. Um, and then the design aspect of it, the designer, her name's Lauren, Laura Palese, and I think she just nailed it, like with the, you know, the graphics and, and the circles and just the way that she tied the whole book together. I'm so proud of the complete kind of out of the box, very cool package that this book is. And, and so much of the reason for that is because of, of the, photographs and the design. So I just had to say that. No, I think it's beautiful. And I think somewhat like, I am not the cook in my house, but in bringing it home to prepare for this, um, the cook in my house was like, oh, this layout is so interesting and so different. And I think that, I mean, maybe you'll start a trend. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I, um, I, a lot of people have asked me like why I would take such a big risk with a second book like this. Um, and it is a huge departure from Deep Run, so I understand that. But it really is like who I am. And that was part of my problem with Deep Run Roots is that I wrote it, I felt so connected to the story. And then because I couldn't articulate the way I wanted it to look, it, it ended up taking on this life that cast me as this like country girl, you know, that, 
that I'm not really, I mean, I, I live in the country, I come from the country, but I, you know, this is, this is who I am and this is how I cook and this is how I, um, and this, this is the way that things that I touch look. And so um, I was just, yeah, it's a huge departure and it was a huge risk and I'm really proud of it. Well, I think, I mean, that's, that's the only way you grow. I think it's beautiful and you should be. Um, Molly asks, how is your family celebrating Thanksgiving this year, given that um, you know, COVID and North Carolina is 10 or fewer people inside, so on and so forth. Yes. Well, um, yeah. Well, you know, I am opening a restaurant in Charleston uh, at the beginning of December. So I'm, I'm going to Charleston at the beginning of next week and we'll be there kind of through Thanksgiving. So my uh, husband and kids are going to come to Charleston and we're going to have a, a I've rented an Airbnb there and we're going to have a small family Thanksgiving and just uh, make the best of it. My parents, um, they may or may not come, but if you all watch The Chef's Life, you know that they're not spring chickens and Scarlett needs to really keep her ass at home. In my <laughs> I do feel like we're all saying that to people in our lives right now. You know, you're the people that really need to pay attention. My dad is being very conscious, but I think my mom is just kind of, you know, over it. It's um, hard. It's it's like there's real fatigue with it. I understand. Yeah, yeah. There are stages to it. And um so we're just gonna it, it's gonna be a, a, a very busy uh Thanksgiving because we we have these restaurants that we're I'm trying to open one. We just opened Chef the Farmer, Ben's working at Benny's and and we're really short staffed because we're trying to just connect the dots so I'm doing things I haven't done in years at Chef and the Farmer and Ben is doing the same so we might I might have turkey breast for the first time ever <laughs> on Thanksgiving well I mean if this is the year of departure then well I don't know if I can go that far <laughs> <laughs> that's too far <laughs> Um, okay, so Tracy asks or says, Quirky Furky is next on my list from the cookbook, but I have already made triple recipes of citrus shine and red weapons and definitely plan on giving as gifts. What would be recommended, sorry, what would be recommended water bath canning time for red weapons? Great question. Um, so you absolutely do not have to can them. Um, I, I generally put them in a jar and just uh, twist the jar tight and put, if I give it to people, I say, this will help keep for two months in your fridge. So <laughs> if you want to can it, you can, but you don't have to. Um, so what I would do is when the, um, for the red weapons, basically you have the tomatoes that you've quartered and then you pour this hot brine on top of them. I would put the tomatoes in the jars and pour the brine on top of them in the jars at that point, and then process them for 10 minutes in a hot water bath. And then they'll be, they can sit on your shelf for as long as you want. But I just want you to know, you don't have to do that. I, I don't. <laughs> um. Do you want me to ask more questions? Do we want to do some I've got this here? So, okay. you know, we, we have more, but go with that. Mm -hmm. Um, so can you see that kind of? Okay. Yes, yeah, sort of. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. My broth, my um meatballs, I put these uh tat soy greens in there. You know, you can use any kind of green you want, and I just poach them. And for me, the point of this is to have some um meatball in every broth. And you'll notice in the recipe in the book, I, I call for cilantro or mint or any kind of soft, uh, bright herb you wanna add, absolutely do that. I don't have any here, so I'm not going to. But I also call for, I believe, lime juice. So, you know, anytime I say lime juice, uh, you could always use lemon juice. Um, anytime I say lemon juice, you could also use lime juice. I don't have lemons or limes here at my office right now. So what I'm gonna use is 
rice wine vinegar. And I'm just going to use like a little quarter teaspoon of that. Because what I'm looking for the lime or the lemon uh, to bring is acid and vinegar will do the same. What I recommend when you're switching out acids is to not always use the same amount. You know, certain vinegars have different um, acidities than, than certain, um, you know, citruses and vinegars have different acidities from others. And just know that with acid, you can add it, but you can't take it away. So I would start with little tiny bits, but any acid will work. I'm gonna put a little bit of salt in here, although my meatballs have probably flavored my broth to the point that I don't even really need that. Um, you could serve this over rice, you could eat it just like this. And like, literally I've made this in front of y'all. Um, I did not make this. If you make this, this will take you about 30 minutes from start to finish. And then it gives you endless, endless opportunities to put together dinner really quickly. And what's more, if you have this, plus let's say Red Weapons or Community Organizer or Herbdacious at home, and you can pick from, from those flavor heroes, it makes putting dinner like together very, very easy and very empowering. And you're gonna feel, and you're gonna be a much better cook for it. That's good. I'm gonna add a little bit more salt. <laughs> so do you all have any more questions for me? Um, <clears throat> Julie asks, um, do you use a sous vide in your cooking parentheses in general or in this book? No, I do not. Um, I was like a sous vide apostle, um, you know, years ago. And now I use it for very particular things at the restaurant. But uh, I really wanted this book to be incredibly approachable for people. And, you know, you'll find that in the book, I use equipment very little. Like I just sh showed you my, my equipment you know, the strategy here, uh, because I want, I want everybody to be able to use it. And I, as I mentioned before, I hate washing dishes. And um, when I look at like the sous vide experience, I look at, you know, all the ways that I could accomplish this without having to have that piece of equipment. Uh, so while I think it's really valuable for people who love like cooking as their passion and their hobby, this book is really for people who want to make um, cooking really simple at home. Um, that makes sense. Maybe they're just a sous vide aficionado, um, <laughs> which is fine. Uh, Connie says, I love the travel and diversity of food in somewhere south. Do you ever plan to film in Charlotte? What are some of the food traditions you like from Charlotte? Any food related recommendations in Charlotte? Well, I think you should Charlotte be people. good recommendations in Charlotte. <laughs> uh, I love Katie and Joe Kindred at Kindred and Davidson. Um, I love, what's your uh, Price's Chicken Coop? Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, it's odd because Charlotte is, you know, basically four and a half hours from where I live. So I've, I've spent less time there than almost anywhere else in North Carolina. But that being said, I think there's a lot to Charlotte that I do not know. And um, so if you have any recommendations about food cultures or communities in the Charlotte area that you think would be um, you know, shed a light on stories that are not often told in the South. And I would love to hear about it. Um, well, guys, you heard her. Go yeah, for it. Tell me. <laughs> I am the worst person for that because I've only lived here a year, six of months, six months of which were in COVID. <laughs> but I have been to the two places you said, so I feel like it was time well spent. Um, oh, phase in. 
Knox exclaims that you need to go to Mertz, M-E-R-T-S. Okay. Um, and then what is Kim Spivey asks, any ideas, oh, this is really relevant. Any ideas of how to apply your flavor heroes to our Thanksgiving meals? Oh my gosh, yes. Um, so, uh, first of all, like little green dress is, you know, I don't know if you're someone who has like green beans at Thanksgiving, but sauteed or blanched green beans tossed with little green dress is an amazing easy side that, you know, you can blanch the green beans ahead of time and just heat them up briefly and toss them with that sauce and you're good to go. Um, these nuts, which is the name of the chapter, are actually uh, spiced pecans, and they make an amazing uh, addition into a dressing or stuffing of any kind. Um, if you are making a pumpkin bread or a pumpkin pie or a sweet potato pie, chop them up and fold them in or chop them up and put them in your crust. Amazing. Um, sweet potential which is like a, a riff on fruit preserves. Take that, uh, blend it or whisk it with some vinegar and some Dijon mustard and make that a glaze for your turkey. And you'll probably never feel as if you need to make gravy again. Um, I mean, and I, I haven't even gotten started on the ways to use Thanksgiving leftovers, which is really what I'm super passionate about. Uh, in the book, you'll see in the herb dishes chapter, there's a recipe called uh, mashed potatoes second coming. And I wrote that because one of the number one questions posed on, number one food questions posed on Google is what to do with leftover mashed potatoes. And I find that we're often after Thanksgiving and Christmas looking for ways to use the mashed potatoes we have. And so this recipe is basically like a mashed potato cake that has herbaceous, which is a little bit of a riff on pesto and garlic confit combined, folded into it. And then the potato cakes are wrapped in strips of bacon and they're roasted. And who doesn't want that the day after Thanksgiving? That sounds amazing. I want Not that right now. Little green dress, the herbaceous. Um, the quirky turkey, like you can blend all of those things with mayonnaise and slap it on that turkey sandwich. You know that that's what you're waiting for. Yeah, that I mean that's the kind of cooking I like to do. So I appreciate. That. <laughs> um, many people have joined in saying that you do need to go to Mertz. It is a soul food restaurant in Uptown, which is what we call downtown. Um, so that is our major recommendation for you. I will do that. Um, Julie says, what are your favorite tomatoes to cook with? I'm not a fan of grocery store Roma tomatoes. Okay, great. I'm glad you brought that up. I'm not a fan of grocery store Roma tomatoes either. However, um, this particular recipe, the red weapons, and I suggest Roma tomatoes because they are firm and somewhat flavorless. Uh, from the grocery store this time of year, it improves them, I would say 200%. And so what you got, what you end up with is like a, a pickled tomato that would never have been able to withstand the pickle if it were a ripe, like German Johnson or Cherokee purple. Um, my favorite tomatoes to actually cook with are, um, what we get every summer. And I think they're like better boys, essentially. They're like a firm uh, canning tomato. And uh, generally every summer I, I put up or can uh, about 50 quarts of those. Um, so I would say that's my, my favorite, but I think every tomato that has a different purpose. Um, and one of the reasons this Red Weapon recipe has, you know, transcended all the years at Chef and the Farmer and is probably the recipe that every cook that's ever worked at Chef and the Farmer takes with them to whatever they do next is because it does make use of and improve on um, a, less, a, lesser, a, a lesser quality or lesser 
flavorful ingredient such as the Roma tomatoes in the grocery store. So I encourage you to try it. And if, if, you, if the outcome is not what you want, I want to hear about it. That's a good answer. Um, Mary asks, any particular seafood recommendations for quirky? Oh, absolutely. So I think quirky, uh, I like how you're using it off shorthand already. Uh, <laughs> um, I like how, like, it is very much, um, it smells like the sea. It, it tastes like the sea. So it, it suggests itself um, on things like grilled fish. I mentioned earlier taking, you know, room temperature softened butter, mixing it with the quirky turkey, maybe a little bit of soy, maybe a little bit of lime, or maybe a little bit of this rice wine vinegar and melting that on a piece of fish. You could also like saute shrimp. I like to cut shrimp in half lengthwise. So you end up with, you know, um, two pieces of shrimp per one and I find they're easier to eat. Sauteing the shrimp, adding like linguine, um, some of the pasta water from cooking the linguine, taking the quirky furky, uh, maybe some butter, maybe some lemon juice and tossing it all together. And you've got an incredible shrimp quirky pasta. Um, I think that, you know, you could do, you could sear scallops and uh, just sprinkle the quirky furky on top once it's done. I mean, you know, I think this really lends itself to all, all types of seafood. You could look um, in the uh, mussels work recipe that is in the little green dress chapter in this book. And I teach you, um, I talk about how much I love uh, mussels and how adamant I am that y'all as home cooks, like learn how to make mussels at home because it's the easiest thing you can possibly do. It takes 10 minutes from in the pot to on the table. If y'all live in the Charlotte area, I know mussels are available to you at Whole Foods and Harris Teeter. Mussels are, um, you know, shellfish that have a longer shelf life than any piece of fish you're going to buy. So for me, it's like an obvious choice for a home cook. So you could take the recipe that's in the little green dress chapter that suggests you um, fold in little green dress in the end. You could fold in quirky furky instead with you know the same lemon juice the same butter dip the same toast in there and you're like you're gonna you're gonna be thankful thank you maybe <laughs> <laughs> I don't know you did make you I feel like I don't know maybe I'll get some muscles this weekend I don't know <laughs> seriously you know whether you're gonna like cook from the book or not I hope you will but read read you know there's a lot of I, I take a stance on a lot of ingredients in this book, like mussels, like why are more home cooks not cooking mussels? We all get them in restaurants, but it's one of the things we get in restaurants that um, require the least technique to cook in a restaurant. Also, they're available in your grocery store. So I make a case for that. I make a case for buying a head of romaine every time you go to the grocery store. I make a case for buying a head of broccoli every time you go to the grocery store a case for cabbage. Like, I feel like there are ingredients that are available to all of us, um, no matter if we have Walmart or Whole Foods that are generally quality across the seasons in our supermarkets. And if you just put them on your shopping list every week and you always have them in your fridge and you have a few of these heroes on hand, then you're gonna be able to put things together so easily and on a budget. Okay, so this, I think this, I, we have like one or two more questions and then we can wrap up, but I think this question sort of speaks to what you're talking about, like how to use the book overall. Um, how would you advise a reader to begin with the book? Like, do you want them to focus on one hero or jump around from the heroes or only start with the no brainers in a hero? Like what is your like best advice for navigating the book as you begin? And I guess, I guess that question really has in mind like for somebody who's looking to simplify their cooking. Right, so ideally I would ask you to pick two heroes and pick a, a, a the day you're off from work or the day that, you know, if it's Sunday or whatever your day is and make two of them. 
Um, I think the community organizer is a really great place to start. I think Little Green Dress is a great place to start. I think Quirky Burkey is a great place to start. Make two of them and then see, uh, I would say, uh, browse through the no-brainers related to those two uh, heroes and then browse through the, the recipes related to those. And then I'm not saying you have to follow any of those things, but as you're putting together dinner that week or lunch that week, you know, think about how to use them. And I think you're going to find like the possibilities are endless and you already have a number of things in your fridge that are going to be completely exalted by adding, you know, the two, one of the two flavor heroes you've chosen. Hmm. I've had a lot of people, I've seen a lot of people um, on social media, starting with the R-rated onions chapter. And, you know, I, that, that's been surprising to me and also not um, because I think caramelized onions are something that we've always thought that we understood or that we did, but in the book, I make a case for how we've not been doing it right. Uh, so it seems to be a really good gateway hero for people um, because it, it's something they kind of already understand. So that might be a good one to start with as well. Okay. Um, so I feel like the natural, uh, first of all, you have received tons of comments that are like, they're very excited to use their Thanksgiving time to try these out. And so many comments about how they love the departure and all like the cases that you make. And so I think the work you put into the book yourself is really reflected in these fans. Um, so lots of gratitude for that. Um, I think that the like natural ending question is, well, it's kind of two. One, one of your fans asks, exciting about the Charleston restaurant. What is the name? Easy drive from Charlotte. So the name, um, this is one of the, you know, names are so hard. Um, but the name for this came so easily. It's called Lenore because I'm from Lenore County. And I love the word Lenore. It looks, you know, it's spelled L-E-N-O-I-R. And so it looks oddly, you know, fancy. Um, and I've had several people ask me if it's French and I'm like, no, it's country. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, we've had a lot of fun with um, reinterpreting uh, Eastern North Carolina for like a Charleston market. And the restaurant is so beautiful. Uh, and, and I think perfectly articulates my style. It is the restaurant that I, you know, I opened Chef and the Farmer when I was 27 and I've learned so much about the restaurant business since. And so, so many times over the years, I've been like, I wish I could do this differently. I wish this looked differently. This, you know, and so this, it, this represents all those things. And so Lenore and it's opening in, um, I think the first week in December, if everything, you know, goes like it's going now, which I don't know if you should call that well or whatever, but it's going. <laughs> I, I understand. I get it. I think everyone understands that. Um, I know I said I was going to end on this last question, but someone just came in and I want to ask their question. Edward said he joined late, but maybe you've covered this. What's your favorite hero? And I don't know if you have, I don't think you've covered that. So I think let's lay it out on the table. <laughs> um, you know, my favorite hero is hard to say because, uh, they all, I mean, I started out with 20 heroes and went on it down to 10 because I felt like I wanted each one to represent something different in your pantry. Um, and I didn't want any overlap. So they all represent my favorite of ah. that type of thing. Um, I knew that there were some flavor heroes on the cutting room floor. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. so there, there very well could be, a, uh, this will make it taste good part two. Uh, <laughs> but, um, you know, I, I tell, you know, if I were making, I can't answer that question. <laughs> you don't have to. I don't think Edward's going to be upset. <laughs> I've said in a lot of interviews, um, little green dress, but I also feel like if you're cooking for kids, like it depends on who you are and and you know what your your needs are. But if you're cooking for kids, then little green dress is definitely not 
the best one. If you're cooking for kids, I think Community Organizer is a great one. I actually think R-Rated Onions is a great one. I think that Can Do Kraut is an incredible one because that represents a um, kitchen project that you can do with your kids. You can watch it change from day to day. You can taste it as it ferments and develops flavor. And then oddly enough, like kids, my kids are not great eaters. In fact, it's, it's one of my, you know, the things that I grapple with in that I'm you know, Vivian Howard and my kids just want hot dogs and hamburgers. But um, I've been able to incorporate a lot of kraut into food that they enjoy. And um, actually a lot of this book is about, uh, there are a lot of recipes where I hide vegetables in dishes from both myself and my kids and my parents. Um, so I think you could, you can't go wrong with Little Green Dress, Community Organizer, R-Rated Onions, Can Do Kraut, Quirky Perky, Red Weapons. Um, actually, if I had to choose one, I'd say Red Weapons. Okay. I like that you really came around and settled. <laughs> it's, it's, it's the easiest. I think it has, you know, you know, at least a five month shelf life in your fridge, as long as it's submerged in it's liquid. Uh, I think you're gonna find a million ways to use it. So I'd start there. Okay. Um, okay, so I think this is the natural last question at these kind of things. And I know that it provides a lot of pressure, but what is next book wise? I mean, I know you are opening a restaurant. I mean, not that that's a big deal or hard work or anything like that. Um, I don't know, you know, I am trying to pursue some tel a television project that I've applied for a Guggenheim fellowship around and so we'll see if that happens. I've also written a pitch for a different pe television project that I'd really like to pursue that I think would be really fun. Um, and what I've learned about, uh, you know, it's interesting because I don't necessarily love being on TV. I don't, I like being on TV, but um, I do that because I have learned that it, it makes things like writing cookbooks possible for me. So, you know, unless I have a platform um, like television, or if I were to like suddenly become great at social media, which I probably will not, um, you know, I don't, I don't necessarily have the opportunity to write cookbooks and I really writing is my passion I think if you read the book you'll see that I have uh it's it's me on the page here and so you know this ecosystem that is Vivian Howard um you know television fuels the opportunity to do a lot of other things and so I um I'm pursuing one to be able to pursue the other no, I think all of us here understand that as, as I think, I, I hate to speak for everyone, but I assume everyone's a lover of narratives if they're here for the most part. So that makes complete sense. Well, I want to thank everyone for being here. Everybody on here is thanking you for doing this for us. We're very grateful. And I just, I just think it was great. Thank you all so much. And Please, um, when you cook from the book, take pictures of it and tag me because I've really, I've gotten so much joy from seeing people do it and get it and understand it. And I hope you all all have a, a Thanksgiving full of all this stuff that'll make it taste good and make people gifts with it. I think, I think the Flavor Heroes will be showing up at a lot of people's Thanksgiving <laughs> celebrations. So... <laughs> Thank you so much, Vivian. Thank you everyone for being here. I just want to remind everyone that if you'd like to get another copy for someone, um, feel free to come to Park Road Books or go to our website or give us a call. Thank you all. Thank you.